Watch this. We've heard the claims about what is being taught in Idaho's classrooms and the low hum of buzzwords like race theory and indoctrination. Like us, a group of lawmakers wanted to know where this was happening in Idaho. Today, they tell us what they found. A hundred days is a long time, and at the State House, it's long enough that some lawmakers are finding interesting and competitive ways to pass the time. Are library boards supposed to be in the business of banning books? Well, not exactly, but it's an issue that's come up in an election in North Idaho, and two of those involved say they were asked to consider censorship of sexually oriented material. For months, a select group of Idaho lawmakers have been touting the theory that Idaho students from pre-K to college are being subjected to social justice indoctrination in school, that their classes were being directed by critical race theory. And it was their job to save our kids from such scourge, a word chosen by Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan. It's an idea, I should say, those lawmakers hope to, well, take off like a Mark Johnson bio page tweet. And it kind of did. As a result, education budgets have been attacked and some say held hostage by lawmakers who say Idaho schools are teaching un-American lesson plans that do not reflect Idaho values. Those broad statements are serious accusations, so Idaho Democrats began investigating what is going on inside Idaho's classrooms. Joe Paris spoke with lawmakers about their findings and what they say the reality is. For weeks, a group of Idaho lawmakers have declared broadly that across all levels of Idaho public education, that there is curriculum being taught to indoctrinate students with liberal views on topics like race and social justice. As a result, education budgets have been turned down several times in the Idaho House. Idaho Democrat lawmakers say they heard enough of broad and generic claims and decided to investigate the issue themselves. I've spoken to professors, I've spoken to university administrators. They were all absolutely perplexed as to where this hysteria about critical race theory is coming from. House Minority Leader Alana Rubel says through her work, she found a common theme, especially in higher education, about the debate of controversial ideas inside the classroom. You know, I haven't been in every classroom at every minute in, <laughs> over the past year, um, but from the investigation I've been able to do, it certainly clearly is the policy of our universities to embrace divergent viewpoints and to allow every student to have their say with no punishment or retribution whatsoever. It's not even defined. We don't even have a definition for what critical race theory is, which is pretty frightening. It's being thrown out there uh, like a boogeyman that we have under our children's bed. And, and the reality is it might scare them, but it's not real. Senator Janie Ward Ingleking says she was unable to find any evidence to substantiate general claims about leftist ideology being forced on students. Her work did find complaints though. We have seen a couple of complaints by students that they felt intimidated in a classroom, but these, this is university classrooms. These are adults and um, they didn't want to complain because they were afraid that it might impact their grade. None of that that I know of dealt with critical race theory. It was more, uh, they just felt like their opinions were being heard. So where's all this coming from? Rubel and Ward Ingle can claim that the narrative is being used as an attack on funding education as a whole by a special interest group who doesn't believe in publicly funded state education. We would all be horrified. That just is not happening. We have contacted schools. We've contacted universities. We've contacted professors and teachers. This just is not happening in Idaho, and it's, uh, it's frightening to see how it's taken hold. All right, Joe, uh, we've talked to teachers, we've talked to even students about this and have yet to find any valid claims of this happening. But any word on how well, this is obviously impacting the budgets, any word on how those education budgets will be brought up again? Um, I'm under the impression from lawmakers that they're hoping to make some significant progress starting tomorrow in the Joint Finance and Appropriation Committee. They've got a number of budgets, including the higher education and the K through 12 budget that they're hoping to work for. Um, of course, there has been work going on behind the scenes over the last week, Brian. Just JFAC hasn't been having their meetings, so they are going to meet tomorrow. And from there, we could see a path forward to how the session could actually wrap up. Yeah, and there's been some rewording of some of the bills that were introduced as early or as late, I should say, as this week. So we'll see how that plays out tomorrow as well. All right, thank you very much, Joe. So no findings from the Democratic investigators, but the research into this indoctrination continues. 
We told you about Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan forming a task force to protect our young people from the scourge of critical race theory, socialism, and the other isms. She said we'd know more about it soon. Well, today we learned she has named her task force to examine indoctrination in Idaho education, or the EIIIE. It's a palindrome, well, something that I'm sure is in the Idaho elementary curriculum. Well, the Avengers are still being assembled for the task force, she said, but it will be comprehensive and will provide a broad representation of the community. They're asking for feedback from the public about experiences you may have had with this issue and even provided anonymous options for teachers who may be afraid to say something in fear of retaliation. There's a link on the Lieutenant Governor's website. What little we do know about the task force is Representative Priscilla Giddings is the co-chair of the EIEI, I should say EIIIE, that's what it is. And they will be having four public meetings at the State House beginning uh, in May and we'll be having them once a month. They say the overwhelming interest affirms the need for this task force and they look forward to rooting out critical race theory and bolstering America's core values. Well, two separate emergency power bills already vetoed by the governor were set to get a last chance shot at survival this week with lawmakers. They were supposed to be veto proof, we were told. Remember that? Well, Senate Bill 1136 wasn't exactly. The override in the Senate failed by one vote. Today, the House side was able to do what senators could not and override Governor Little's veto of House Bill 135. It's supposed to slide some of the executive branch's ability to make decisions during a declared state of emergency back to the legislative leg of government. A lot of lawmakers believe the governor had too much power during the pandemic this past year, and those quick and widespread decisions made by the governor, well, they believe they should have at least had a say in them like how to spend emergency funds from the federal government. Here's how some of today's two hour debate sounded. Not only that, but you've heard some emotional testimony and, and, and right now there is a lot of emotion because of the situation that, that presented itself with this pandemic. Making decisions based on emotion is never good. Reasoned decisions are what we should always be making. The powers that we're debating are inherently legislative powers. They are lawmaking powers. They are money spending powers. There is no traditional executive branch power that we are limiting in any way through this legislation. Now, I am asking that we, as this body, have some fortitude, and I'm asking that we have some backbone. Well, the override had some backbone, passing 48 to 19, three more votes than they needed for that coveted two thirds majority. It will now head over to the Senate side where it will also need a two thirds majority to become law. But based on what happened earlier this week, that may not exactly be a guarantee. Here we are on day 101 and debating this veto ain't much fun. The gentleman on the second floor wants us to pursue this issue once more. But I think I'm just ready to be done. That poem may be a pretty good example of exactly how well bored legislators may be getting as this session drags beyond the 100 day benchmark. Another example. Well, let's just say that that benchmark wasn't the only mark mentioned today at the State House. And that, that many of the directives coming out from the gentleman on the second floor were as random and unexplained as the KTVB tweet about Mark Johnson last night. Yeah, we didn't kill his mic. That was just the dead silence that was in the House chamber. It's OK, Representative Cheney. We know how it feels when a joke just doesn't quite land. That wasn't the only drop today, though, during this veto override debate. Social media was also responsible for another word reference heard on the House floor. Representative McCrosty of Garden City, who is also not only a poet, but a teacher when he's not stuck at the State House, he got a suggestion from a Twitter follower yesterday when he asked who filled out their bingo card with the legislative session lasting 100 days. Rational Republican of Idaho responded with, I did, but I still need one more spot for the win. I'm looking for the word cattywampus to be used on the floor during the debate. A challenge accepted by meme by Representative Cheney, followed by another meme about who could say it first. Well, Representative McCrosty for the win. If something goes cattywampus in our state, we need to act nimbly and expediently particularly around those election laws, that maybe the balance of powers had become a bit cattywampus. They got him in, 
but Mr. Cheney did get the bonus points for that Mark Johnson drop. So we'll consider it a draw, a standstill, if you will, which is fitting that along with cattywampus, which means something that is not lined up correctly, is a pretty accurate description of how the 2021 legislative session is going on day 101. Catawampus, the alternative spelling of that, by the way, also defined as an imaginary, imaginary fierce wild animal, which might help move things along if one was actually let loose in the state house. A controversial election, which is really nothing new, but it is pretty rare for a nonpartisan ballot. It appears though some partisan politics have entered into a local library board election, and it is centered on censorship. If you haven't been able to tell, we don't really shy away from controversial topics here on the 208. In fact, we prefer to shine a bright light on them. So if you have something controversial you want us to look into, well, text us, tell us about it. The number is on your screen, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. And we'll take some fun topics too. Don't forget to send those. Who would have thought an election to decide who sits on a library board could elicit a controversy? But that's what's happening in North Idaho right now. Next month in Kootenai County, there are two seats on the five member Community Library Network Board of Trustees that is up that are up for grabs. There are four candidates vying for those two spots. And I know what you're thinking. Why should I care who sits on a library board? Don't they just have to make sure there are books on the shelves and the Internet bill is paid? And if I should care, how can I make an educated decision about who I would want to be on the library board? Well, the Kootenai County Republican Central Committee thought the same thing. So they decided this year they would vet candidates up for election, a public service, if you will. Since the public couldn't possibly ask questions of every candidate, they're going to do it. And then they would let voters know if they passed muster based on their GOP criteria. Didn't matter that this library district board position is nonpartisan. So back to that question of why should I care who sits on a library board? Because according to two library board candidates who were interviewed by the Kootenai County Republican Central Committee, there's a very strong concern about censorship and banning books at this seven library collective in North Idaho. When incumbent Bob Fish and one time candidate Cynthia Rayburn, both registered Republicans, learned they were going to go through a 10 minute interview with five members of the Central Committee, they filled out the questionnaire and they got the resumes ready. And several weeks ago, when Cynthia showed up for her subcommittee meeting above the deli at the Coeur d'Alene Super One grocery store, she assumed committee chair, vice chair that is, Bob Barons, Rob Barons, and the other four members would focus the interview around routine voting history and basic political questions. But Cynthia said a majority of the questions she faced during her 20 minute interview went another direction. It was some issues of the LGBTQ community. They were concerned that some books were being provided on that topic to teen readers and even younger. And I don't know if that's accurate or not. I believe such materials are available in our libraries, but that's okay. 
uh, some materials in our libraries may make readers uncomfortable. And what was your position? Well, I was a little surprised that those were even to be discussed in an interview for a political position for an election. So I was careful in how I phrased my response that while certain topics may not appeal to me or to anyone using a library, that we cannot focus our materials strictly on one perspective. So when they asked you about these, you said they kind of focused on these a lot of your interview. Yes. Did you interpret them as like they were asking you to be in favor of censorship? Yes, I was under that impression. And in subsequent conversations, I was under that impression. They never used the word censor and they never used the word ban, but the, the intent was there. Yes, are you in favor of these? And if you were elected, would you support these materials in our libraries or schools? District Library Board incumbent Bob Fish went through the same type of interview weeks later. And then one of the members had a cell phone uh, with uh, a book on it and read me several passages uh, from the book that was uh, had to do with lifestyle that some people might be very uncomfortable with. When you say uh, lifestyle, what are you referring to? Uh, homosexuality, drag queens seem to be a big uh, uh, question around here because it happened over in Spokane and some libraries. But most of the questions were uh, whether we uh, allowed books of this uh, type in the library as far as their questioning uh, was concerned. And, and of course I said, we do not censor books uh, in our library at all. You got the impression they were asking you to censor some books. Oh, definitely. Uh, again, they didn't use that word. They asked me if I would allow this kind of, of content in the library. And I said, no, I don't censor books. And when you said, I'm not in the job of censoring books, what was their reaction? Well, somewhat amazed. I think they expected me to back off of that position. Or perhaps they didn't know that libraries in general are very much against uh, uh, censoring any kind of material. Uh, we're sensitive only uh, in doing our best to make sure that uh, young people uh, don't have pornographic type material that they can uh, read at any time. Should people be concerned that these types of questions are being asked of candidates for a library board? Yes, I feel definitely they should be concerned. It's not a, po a party issue. I want to be clear about that. Not even just a topical issue. This is a concern for anyone who'd like to serve in public office. It is a great concern. And if it can happen at this small local level, it's a very important board, but let's face it, it's Kootenai County, Idaho. This is not global. But if it can happen here and be accepted here, then how can we possibly affect the change that's in the press almost daily on a national level about election procedures? Cynthia said she withdrew her candidacy shortly after her interview with the subcommittee. Bob ultimately was not endorsed by the Central Committee, something he thought would be a sure thing considering his resume. A lifelong Republican, former member of both San Diego and Los Angeles County's Republican Central Committees, plus the four years of service as a trustee of the Community Library District in Coeur d'Alene already, which he says, under his leadership, they were able to get their finances in order. And because of that, the district would not be collecting taxes this year. It's usually some pretty good points in Republican circles. Speaking of points, that's how the Central Committee said they rated the candidates, and then an endorsement was decided by a secret ballot. So we brought these con censorship concerns to the chair of the Kootenai County Republican Central Committee, and this is what Brent Regan had to say. As chairman of the KCRCC, I can say categorically that the committee never demanded the candidates censor any materials. My understanding is that one of the participants, a parent of a small child, asked Mr. Fish, or of small children, asked Mr. Fish if it was appropriate for the library to be purchasing books which promoted transgenderism to early readers, specifically K through sixth grade. After narrowly missing being one of the top two candidates, it was Mr. Fish who made the leap and implied that the Central Committee demanded censorship. No such demand was made. Mr. Regan told us he had spoken with Mr. Fish just last week, and he could tell that he was upset, but said it was clear that Mr. Fish believes he was entitled to be one of the supported candidates, and because he was not, in his mind, the process must be defective. 
I doubt Mr. Fish would be critical of the process had he gained our support. Both Bob and Cynthia refute those claims. In fact, Cynthia didn't even go through the process long enough to get a rating. But here we have two library board candidates with the same story and a third candidate referring to similar interview topics in a letter to the editor of the Coeur d'Alene Press. Should we be concerned that questions like these are being posed in a little library district election in North Idaho? Well, when you consider that the Kootenai County Republican Central Committee Chair, Brent Regan, is also the sitting chair of the Idaho Freedom Foundation, the same group that has been instrumental in pushing this critical race theory agenda, you do have to wonder where else this might be popping up. Hey, if you're into astronomical things and like to watch the sky tonight, the Lyrids meteor shower is peaking and we have clear skies to be able to see it, especially after midnight until about 5 a.m. or so. This isn't one of the biggest meteor showers of the year, but it does produce a lot of these bright fireballs. So maybe you might want to step out there in the middle of the night and take a look. Right now it's 64 degrees and clear skies in Boise, 60 in Twin Falls and in the mid to upper 50s in the mountain areas, a beautiful spring day. It's not just a little bit cool and breezy in some locations, but look what's coming by the weekend. Tomorrow we have a system dropping into the north that will bring a few isolated showers and maybe a thunderstorm or two to some of the mountain areas, especially the west central and central mountains. Friday it'll be dry, but then by Saturday we've got the first chance of rain we've seen in a month. A large low pressure trough swinging into the region. It promises widespread mountain snow and valley rain beginning Saturday and lasting until about Monday. So the Forecast calls for dry weather tomorrow and Friday. Temperatures in the upper 60s to near 70. Cooling off by the weekend to the upper 50s with rain and mountain snow gradually drying out next week. Don't go away on the 208. We're right back in a couple of minutes.
All right, we got a better poem sent in by Toby, better than Representative McCrosty's that he read on the House floor today. A poem for our legislature. First, they tried to grab the governor's seat. They are still trying. Then a specter of several unknown definitions arose from one side. Oh, the crying. Please get to work and do your job with no more fails. Otherwise, your employer, by ballot, will run you out of town on rails. That is awesome, Toby. Thank you for sharing that with us. Why is there a bill about eliminating so-called critical race theory when Republicans can't define what it is and our lieutenant governor is just forming a task force to see if it even exists? We used to call that getting the cart in front of the horse. It's a good point, Steve. A lot of people have the same question. Critical race theory is about coming to grips with the race issues in this country we sadly still face. I'm worried what message the legislature is trying to send by trying to say that somehow that that somehow is indoctrination, especially in today's climate. That's a very good point, Jacob, who, by the way, says, P.S. Mark Johnson. I prefer this poem by the late DMX. That's what I like.